Thank you, uh, Madam Chairman. Uh, the Citizens Association at Georgetown is dedicated to the restoration, preservation, maintenance, and protection of the historic character of Georgetown, including the streetscape in our National Historic Landmark Historic District. While the citizens of Georgetown uh, support, in a general sense, the deployment of 5G technology in D.C., we believe that it needs to take into account the unique character of the streetscape of the district and its individual neighborhoods, including the Georgetown uh, Historic District. Uh, the draft small cell guidelines, in our opinion, are inadequate. They would uh, permit the telecom carriers to install a forest of ugly poles bristling with radio antennae on every street in historic districts and in the monumental core. The guidelines permit up to six poles or more on typical streets, three for each block face or side of the street uh, in historic districts, or one for every hundred feet or so of street length, uh, although there's some mention of 200 or 300 feet being the uh, range of an individual antennae, we're talking about four or five carriers uh, who have to, according to the guidelines, each have their own pole. Each pole would be up to 31 feet high or higher uh, and carry two large antennae plus a small refrigerator-sized box euphemistically called a cabinet. Uh, while the guidelines require the cabinet to be buried underground in historic districts such as Georgetown, the carriers have uniformly said that that is not feasible. It would also be a huge eyesore uh, to have a large graded vault with a sump pump and fans every 100 feet or so. Uh, in the sidewalks of Georgetown and other historic districts, even if it were possible to do that without disturbing tree roots and utilities. So basically, the, the whole concept of vaulting, I think, is a, a, a non-starter, both from the carriers and from the historic uh, districts in which uh, it would be totally out of place. Uh, the guidelines do attempt uh, to make some, uh, uh, bring some uniformity into the look of these new poles by specifying they need to match the design of existing streetlights, uh, which cannot be used to mount antennae. That means that the Washington Globe light poles in historic areas such as Georgetown uh, would be uh, the uh, design guideline. However, the guidelines do not pose, impose any restrictions on the dimensions of the pole, the size and location of the antenna, and the cabinet. Some carriers propose to mount the cabinet at a street level next to a pole, others on the pole. Uh, AT&T puts it inside the pole, which would then have to have a larger diameter to swallow it. There's no requirement on height, just the maximum 31 feet. That means that every block will have a multitude of different ugly pole designs, further degrading the streetscape. It does not have to be that way. The, the guidelines erroneously seem to accept unverified carrier claims that they cannot implement small cell technology without antennae every couple of hundred feet. In fact, small cell signals can range from 200 to 900 meters depending on the spectrum used, and that's the key. While existing 4G spectrum uh, could and will be used to deploy 5G in the immediate future, the carriers are asking DDOT for the number of pole locations required to support the highest frequency spectrum, uh, the, and they're exaggerating the potential coverage of their 5G antennae. Therefore, the carriers have no intention of deploying 5G anytime soon. There are no 5G phones today, and while some may become available in 2019, the carriers will continue to use the new spectrum to support 4G for many years. We're in the beginning stages of a multi-year transition to 5G, and we have the time to do it right. For example, the number of poles per block in the draft guidelines should be cut roughly in half to reflect the real current needs of the carriers. While capacity is an issue driving the use of the shorter wavelength spectrum, we need to get a reality check on what small cell coverage each carrier actually needs on a particular block. It will have to depend on the demand from that block, and I suggest to you that the demand from residential areas is considerably different from business areas uh, where there may be an, a need for the higher uh, speed that the small cells will provide. Uh, there are other impediments to the uh, placement of, of poles in uh, 
residential areas, including uh, tree foliage and other obstacles, that technology is there. The City Council, we think, needs to put a break on this runaway train and require a deliberative process that results in binding specifications issued as regulations, not guidelines. And the public needs to be given an opportunity to weigh in on what those regulations permit. We have been given very limited opportunity so far in this process to, to be heard. Uh, Thank you. We have been heard, but it was, it was a very limited opportunity and we have not been able to uh, even understand the needs of the carriers and the needs of, these, of this new technology. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Eames? so much for having us here today. Uh, my name is Betsy Eames, Chair of Trees for Georgetown, a nonprofit organization under the auspices of the Citizens Association of Georgetown. Our organization raises funds to plant and maintain street trees in the residential areas of Georgetown and to educate our community on the importance and care of these trees. We plant our trees with the permission of the Urban Forestry Division of DDOT and also work closely with Casey Trees. We have planted almost 3,000 street trees since our inception in 1989. Trees for Georgetown would like to express its concern for the potential damage to DC street trees by the 5G small cell installation. With regard to the placement of standalone poles vis-a-vis -vis street trees, the draft design guidelines call for these poles to be aligned with street lights, third party poles, and st street trees in order to maintain a visual and physical organization of structures within the right of way. Trees for Georgetown supports the guidelines in that these standalone poles should not be placed where it limits the ability of the District of Columbia to plant a street tree in the future, regardless of whether the district plans to plant a tree in that location at the time the application is submitted. We further support the guidelines in that a standalone pole should not be placed within the critical root zone of existing trees. Street trees should not be removed nor have their critical root zones comprised for the installation of any small cell infrastructure. However, Trees for Georgetown has grave concerns that 5G small cell implementation would have adverse impact not only on the appearance of street trees, but also their health, which the guidelines fail to address. We are told that the 5G signal from standalone poles to houses and cell phones can be disrupted by foliage, which raises the concern that carriers might seek to prune trees. Trees for Georgetown urges that a policy be put in place that would prohibit tree pruning for any purpose whatsoever. Random pruning by non-professionals would be a disaster, causing our street trees to be grossly disfigured or worse yet, killed. Uh, following my testimony at the October 15th Public Space Committee meeting, I received an email from Brian Stover, Principal Engineer of Verizon Wireless, which I would like in part to read. Uh, he says he is writing as a follow-up in our comments, and he said specifically, I wanted to address the issue of tree trimming. While it is true that trees and foliage can have an impact on wireless communications, Verizon Wireless has no plans to remove or trim any trees in Georgetown or greater Washington for that matter. We also agree with the concerns raised regarding the vaulting of equipment. In addition to operational issues, the larger size of the vault could present a greater impact to tree roots. We strongly believe our design with the electronic equipment located in the base of the pole represents the best solution. Again, I just want to confirm for you that Verizon Wireless has no intention of touching any trees for any purpose. If you should have any questions regarding the small cell project, please do not hesitate to contact me. Trees for Georgetown requests that all signers of the MLA be required to pledge the same, that no trees will be pruned for any purpose in the installation of small cell infrastructure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Ms. Santoyo? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Elsa Santoyo, I am a director of the Citizens Association of Georgetown and the chair of its Historic Preservation and Zoning Committee. Georgetowns and the other equally unique settings of other areas of this city are threatened by the installation of small cells, consisting of antennas and ganged radios mounted on new and existing poles. Because small cells will occupy above ground public space, supplementing existing street lights and traffic signals, their appearance and quality of construction are paramount. So, 
is mere design guidance, which is what the design guidelines proposed by DDOT are. An appropriate approach to what promises to have a huge visual impact? No, I don't think so. The city should instead follow the standard for contracting for fabrication of streetlights and traffic signal poles. Um, this is typically done by issuing design specifications that stipulate height, width, materials, and finish that the contractor shall provide. CFA and NC PC commissioners have agreed in uh, various informational meetings and have already recommended that DDOT and the city engage architecture, urban planning, and design professionals to develop design specifications for small cells to ensure design excellence on streets and alleys district-wide. Design specifications for district-wide small cells should, one, be locale-specific. Their height and appearance should be harmonious with the distinctive visual character and scale of each setting, that is, the monumental core, mid- and high-rise mixed-use areas, and finally, two- and three-story residential and commercial historic districts. But they should also be uniform across all carriers within each specific locale. No varying designs within each specific locale. Finally, to minimize the number of small cells in city streets and alley, the district should pursue the feasibility of mounted equipment on roofs as an alternative to deploying pole-mounted antennas. Co-location also actually may not be an appropriate response to doing so. Everywhere, these facilities will need to be bigger than the single carrier um, facilities. Typically, from what we've been told, they are the size of heritage street trees. It's very large. These design goals will ensure the facilities do not mar the unique visual qualities of the district that generate revenue by attracting visitors and retaining residents. I provided a more fully detailed discussion in the hard copy that you have in front of you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Commissioner Wilcox? Uh, yes, Madam Chair. My name is Jim Wilcox. I'm uh, um, Could you put on your mic, please? How do I do that? <laughs> you just kind of hope for the does best. That, does that do it? Okay. Yes. Um, my name is Jim Wilcox. I'm a commissioner for ANC 2E06. I'm testifying here personally today. Um, Joe Gibbons, who you're going to hear from later. So Elsa that would be you're here as a public witness? Yes, I'm here as a public witness with three minutes. Thank you. Um, uh, we've been the two ANC commissioners citywide who've been most extensively involved with small cells uh, per an article in the Northwest Current where we commended for having done so. Uh, we participated uh, with ELSA as the only real resident representatives at the MLA process and through most of the earlier prior hearings. Uh, you've already heard from Elsa. Um, I've been trying to figure out what I could most helpfully contribute to today's uh, discussion. Um, as far as health aspects go, um, I've met several times with Deborah Davis and been on conference calls with her, and I can attest that she's uh, connected with me with other experts from around the country who agree with her uh, evaluation of the health I issues involved with small cells. I'm not a telecom engineer, but I've decided briefly to explain why is a simple matter of common sense the proliferation of small cell poles that the providers are seeking is not necessary to successfully implement small cell technology. Um, I've submitted um, an ANC resolution which you can read at your convenience which runs through some of those issues rather than read it. Uh, let me make a few brief comments. Um, it's a very familiar refrain to me from the meetings that I've attended both privately and publicly with the providers that the purpose of 5G technology is to bring wireless technology down to the street. However, it's curious that they seek to do that on poles which would range from approximately 30 to 51 feet high. Um, this is about the same height as many existing rooftops. Uh, what does this really mean? I think is a good question for you to ask. Um, Verizon is currently seeking to install five, five G facilities on existing commercial rooftops in Georgetown alone in a single month. 
Um, I have references to the particular cases. If you're interested, I could submit them later. Um, but this, to me, undeniably demonstrates that rooftop installations are a practical and viable alternative without installing numerous new poles in the public space. Um, to me, that's almost a complete answer to a lot of the questions that have been raised today. I believe that should be a first priority under any guidelines that are adopted, and I think it will eliminate a lot of the issues that we're concerned about today. Um, secondly, um, two months ago, Verizon testified before the ANC that many poles are needed because the range of 5G transmitters is only about 300 feet. Uh, this is belied by ANC, by Verizon's own CEO, in testimony that's been given earlier today referencing 3,000 feet. Um, finally, I personally support the Committee of 100s and others' position that co-location or hoteling should be strongly incentivized, and I believe it should be uh, required if anything is permitted on the street, unless it's technically impossible. And I don't believe they can conceivably meet that standard because I've had personal meetings with Carly Didion of Crown Castle, one of the hoteling companies. He, she's told us that hoteling involving these same companies has been achieved and implemented in other parts of the country, so why can't it be done here? Um, in closing, as a concerned resident of the district, I urge you in the strongest possible terms to help us avoid this extremely harmful impact to DC's uh, existing streetscapes, and I want to say that I st also strongly support the comments that uh, my councilman Jack Evans made previously. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you all very much. You know there are these um, suggestions that are being made, and uh, I, I'm hoping to collect them in a list because I want to find out from the uh, carriers and from DDOT, you know, what their uh, reaction to them is. Uh, for example, Ms. Uh, Santoyo, the idea that maybe it's not the district is not one space, it is many different spaces, and so that in specific areas you might have different guidelines, for example, uh, or this idea which has come up before, well, you know, if you get the 31 feet and then you're allowed 10 extra feet for 5G, that's four, that's a four-story building, <laughs> the way I figure it, and so why couldn't they be on the tops of buildings? But all of these things, I, I, I'm grateful to you all for uh, collecting them because I need to have some uh, reference points to get some answers here about why why we're doing things the way we're doing, which is wholly apart from the rather um, fast and uh, quite closely held process that has been gone through. That's uh, that's one thing, but I'm talking about the merits now. So, in any event, thank you all for uh, coming to testify today. I'd like to now call, please, Greta Fuller, uh, Commissioner Fuller of ANC 888A06. Joe Gibbons, uh, Commissioner Gibbons of ANC 2E. Is Ms. Fuller here? Does anybody know Ms. Fuller? Is she here? Okay, we have Commissioner Gibbons. Um, Joanne Niehaus, Penn Quarter Neighborhood Association. Newhouse. New house. It's like having a new house. Well, did you bring any for the committee? Oh, okay. Well, you can uh, give them to co the committee at any time. The record will remain open for the delivery of the chocolates. Okay. All right. Do you want to bring your chair sort of around the end, if, you, if that's what you want? Oh, dear. I'm very concerned now. Okay. All right. Uh, Susan Kimmel, Ward 3 Vision. Here, okay. David Dunning, a public witness, not here? Apparently you're not supposed to sit next to Mr. New Miss Newhouse. If I were you, I would like go to another hearing room. <laughs> um, Daniel Flores, 
Greater Washington Board of Trade. We do want you to sit down, Miss Newhouse. Okay. Okay. Well, if you're willing to risk the third seat, does anybody have a surgical mask? <clears throat> okay. Okay, Commissioner Gibbons, uh, you're up. Good afternoon, Councilmember Che, and thank you very much for having us here. And Cole, thank you very much for all your time, too. Appreciate it. Uh, my name is Joe Gibbons. I'm chair of ANC2E. And uh, you have my comments. And, and I was, what I'm speaking to and, and is the, the matter of the installation and maintenance of the small cell 4G, 4 or 5G in the district to obtain a permit for the use and occupancy of the public space in and in the right of way, the Public Space Committee and DDOT. Um, the last hearing in the same council, I don't want this to be treated like a dumpster space or blocking off sidewalk. I'm here because I'm an ANC commissioner who deals with uh, my committee, uh, my constituents on a daily basis for OGB issues. They're asking me, what are we doing about this? And we go to public space meetings. And the public space is great. Associate Director Mark, who is the nicest, most dedicated public servant, really works hard at this. But this needs, uh, my thrust of my testimony is this needs a special standing committee for public space. I want, I would like you and the mayor and the city council to look at how we set up public space and deal with small cells. The same committee that deals with the you know, uh, sidewalk cafes, uh, dumpsters, and blocking off sidewalks can't be the same public space committee we use for understanding the maintenance and installation of small cells in, in the district. So I'm calling for a, a whole new standing subcommittee or standing committee, standing committee for public space that deals dedicated with public that deals with small cells only. I believe that the director, who's a great guy, Marudian, and uh, associate director Mark Ukin, uh, create this new public space committee that would hire the appropriate design and landscape architects to ensure the district and all the wards have the installation and maintenance of small cells befitting our nation's capital. This the standing committee uh, will deal with installations and maintenance. Its only mission or purpose is to ensure the district and FCC compliance to design technical and safety specifications for the installation and maintenance of small cell and 4, 5G. And you know, through the FCC order, I'm familiar with it. I'm not trying to create a hindrance. This, this, this should meet twice a month, not just once a month. It should have the ability to meet twice a month. The Public Space Committee in the standing should have a representative from the D.C. City Council, should have an ANC uh, commissioner on there, a private residence. This is not earth shattering or breaking. This is what ABRA has. This is what HPRB has. This, the use of public space and occupancy for small cells is almost perpetual. It's a perpetual use of it. Therefore, we need a perpetual standing, sub, a standing committee for public space. There's a lot of S's in there. For this, it must be responsible and reactive to all the upcoming 4, 5, 6G. That's why I believe that we need a, a new public space standing committee for small cells. And then we can utilize the top system, which I utilize all the time. Um, but it needs to be redesigned for, with the current use. It should. Each TOPS application should include specifications, site plans, before and after designs. All maintenance orders must go through TOPS. Notice to the affected ANC. Currently, a TOPS system, for most part, doesn't send a notification to an affected ANC. The, in the permit and the process, coverage reasoning for the permit application in plain English. If they're asking for another poll location, why? What is the coverage reasoning? No permit or prior review by public states or DDOT, all public all permit applications must be sent to the affected ANC. If you read the MLA, which I know you're, you and Cole are very familiar with, it says that all public space permit applications that do not meet the guidelines will be sent for review. Well, they're internalizing the application. I don't want that to be internalized. Every resident or business deserves the ability to have a public hearing by its ANC before a poll is placed in front or near their property. This clearly fits into the FCC shot clock guidelines as ANCs meet every 30 days with the exception of the month of August. However, affected ANCs are not mandated to, per to review all permits and maintenance. You know, you can imagine that time, and I get this too, I never heard about why is that going in front of me. If we get, as an ANC, we get a listing of all the affected or all the poll locations and we can send out a notice or we can publicize it, we can hold public hearings once a month 
We do this for all OGB CFA. We get 40 to 60 OGB CFA applications every month. Some are not new, half are new, a third are new. We use neighbor notification, we publish it, we go. When that poll goes in front of that business or that neighbor, it's gonna be traumatic. It's gonna be, and they're gonna say, why didn't you tell us? Why didn't, was there a hearing? And that's what I'm saying. If we have a new public space standing committee dedicated for small cells with the proper representation on there, then we can answer those questions and say, we are meeting twice a month. Here it is. ANCs, there's, there's 296 commissioners. We, we deal with these problems on every, every other kind of issue. We can handle this. So thank you very much. That's where I, I'm going at. Thank you very much. Ms. Kimmel? Good afternoon. Yeah, good afternoon, uh, Chairman Jay and members of the committee. My name is Susan Kimmel, and I live in Tenley Town. I submit this testimony on behalf of Ward 3 Vision, a grassroots organization whose members support smart growth and can imagine our neighborhoods as more walkable, sustainable, and vibrant. We generally avoid citywide policies, particularly those concerning aesthetics. However, the requirements of small cell infrastructure needed for 5G will impact everyone's experience of the urban environment. We appreciate the opportunity to testify today so that the regulations enacted at the federal level and by the city minimize long-term damage and develop policies to maximize the co-location of equipment so as to reduce both the amount of equipment at ground level for pedestrians to negotiate and the visual clutter of too many poles. Another option would be to explore the possibility of rooftop antenna. The draft of DC's small cell design guide, guidelines addresses the needs of the various sections of the city, yet it does not specify a means of encouraging or requiring co-location. The parts of the guidelines we concur that with 8.2 that require new poles to be located in the amenity zone so as not to block movement, poles to be located not, so as not to remove trees or prevent planting in the future as well as protecting root zones, and poles that do not block bike racks or cabbie stations. However, we wish to express concern over provision 7.4 requiring that replacement poles be exactly the same in outward appearance because sometimes other models for 5G antenna where the equipment is mounted in a larger diameter base with a lower center of gravity might be preferable in certain situations. This means that DC needs to retain control over the approval process. But the FCC's declaratory ruling adopted September 26 of this year runs roughshod over local ordinances and guidelines. Our primary concern that many of the FCC's rules by setting shot clocks, limiting fees, and determining when aesthetic consider <coughs> considerations are legitimate will stymie the city's ability to control the build out of infrastructure. As FCC Commissioner Jessica Rosenworcel pointed out in her partial dissent, this is extraordinary federal overreach. It is hard to believe that in this vast and diverse country, one size fits all. How can regulations for small towns be meaningful when applied to the complexity of cities like Washington? In particular, the shot clock may prevent case-by-case -case review of antenna sites for historic sections of the city where that may be the most appropriate process of approval. Needless to say, this concession to industry to build out as quickly and cheaply as possible is intended to give the U.S. an advantage in the race against China to adopt 5G, mainly for the port support of self-driving cars. But again, Rosenworcel under underscores this folly. Uh, for one, the cost savings are justified by saying that the companies will provide better coverage in rural areas, yet nothing in the language of the FCC order will guarantee that the savings be reinvested to serve rural communities. Secondly, how can the U.S. win this race uh, when we shoot ourselves in the foot by placing tariffs on Chinese imports? We can't run in this race when we can't, when we don't even produce the raw ingredients, including most of the circuitry and equipment needed for the 5G antenna. 
having the tariffs will increase the construction costs for carriers and tower companies, which motivates them to save more money on the approval process and fees. If the city council is not able to control the design and impact of the 5C interest infrastructure on DC so that it will do more good than harm, then Ward 3 Vision urges the mayor to join others, the mayor of Seattle, Nashville, and other jurisdictions in challenging the FCC's overstepping of federal power. On the other hand, some federal laws have been ignored but perhaps should be implied. Because the federal government licenses the use of radio frequency spectrum, Ward 3 Vision joins those who support that NEPA, the National Environmental Pol Policy Act, be invoked to determine the long-range consequences of RF radiation on humans and other forms of life when we will all be exposed to increased amounts of radiation for 24 hours a day. Thank you. Thank you very much.